Hey Blinders, it's Sean O'Connell and I am joining you for another bonus episode of Real Blind because we have a really cool interview that we wanted to bring to you for a South by Southwest documentary that is making the rounds. Uh, it is called Tom Petty, Somewhere You Feel Free. And I agreed to uh, do this interview and watch this doc because I'm a huge Tom Petty fan myself. And this is in particular uh, a period of of time during his career where he was working on uh, what I consider to be one of his best solo albums called Wildflowers. And the director, Mary Wharton, who's joining us for this bonus episode, um, took this amazing archival footage that she had of Tom Petty and him collaborating with Rick Rubin uh, and coming off of the Full Moon Fever album and really figuring out how he can grow as a solo artist away from the Heartbreakers. And it's a really great look into uh, Petty at that point in his career. Some really excellent interviews with Rick Rubin after the fact to talk about how he approached uh, Tom Petty's music and the fact that Rick Rubin comes from a background where he's, you know, really into hip hop and redefining the way a lot of those artists uh, are presented uh, in, uh, in album form and figuring out how he can bring that sort of spark to Tom Petty and his career. So if you like Tom Petty, if you're into the Wildflowers album by any way, shape, or form, this is a really excellent documentary. I'm so glad that it got picked up by South by Southwest, and I'm thrilled that Mary Wharton uh, was able to visit the Real Blend podcast and sit down with us. So without further ado, a bonus episode this week of Real Blend, our interview with Mary Wharton on behalf of the Tom Petty documentary, Somewhere You Feel Free. I am curious in a chicken or an egg kind of way approaching the project was it the wildflowers era that you were focused on beforehand or did you just want to tell a tom petty story and that archival footage kind of pointed you in that direction no it was definitely the the the, the footage was the egg and um the footage had been discovered and uh the tom petty estate you know being run by his daughter she looked at it and realized that there was enough material there for a film and started to um, try to figure out who could, uh, who would be the right director to, to put it into um, uh, 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 some sort of a, a story. And, um, and that's, and I came into it because uh, Adria Petty, Tom's daughter, she and I had worked together a long time ago and had remained friends. And she called me up and asked if I was available and interested. And, you know, I'm a huge Tom Petty fan. So of course I was interested. And as, as, as luck or circumstance would have it, uh, we were in the middle of a pandemic and, and, and I wasn't working <laughs> like the rest of the world. I had been shut down and um, was just really grateful to have an opportunity to work on something that was archival based because it, it was pandemic friendly, if you will. Um, but uh, also what a treasure trove of material that it turned out to be. I couldn't believe um, that I heard songs you know, that were referenced as being from this album that I just assumed were heartbreaker songs. Um, you wreck me and you don't know how it feels. Like, I know I was around when those uh, songs came out, yeah. <laughs> but I couldn't connect them to that album. Uh, it was it was pretty mind blowing just to really understand how much of this, like, it feels like a late seventies, almost mid eighties, you know, Tom Petty look. And I wonder if that speaks to just the type of artist that he was. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that Tom had uh, a, a, he had a sound that came from within him. It wasn't something that he was faking or was, you know, concocting for uh, particular records. And and, you know, you had uh, the, the core of the Heartbreakers really was, you know, Ben Montent and Mike Campbell. And then eventually they brought the bass player, Howie Epstein, into the into the mix, too. So it essentially was the Heartbreakers. I mean, obviously, the original drummer, Stan Lynch, was a powerhouse of a drummer and certainly a, a huge piece of the original Heartbreakers sound. But I think that, you know, the 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 remaining core uh, at work on Wildflowers were able to connect to that thing that they did so well, you know, and 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 I think that that Tom had a great sense about um, 
sort of sequencing of an album and how to create an arc, a, a, almost a, like a story arc within the album of where you, you know, you want some, some uh, soft, pretty songs and some emotional songs. And then you just want some raucous, you know, party, you know, tracks and you want some, some bangers on there. And, 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 uh, and so, and I think that, 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 that he, you know, also was having a lot of fun during the making of this record and, um, and he wanted to, you know, have fun with it. So. I'm fascinated by the process of uh, documentaries, particularly archival, um, when you're at the mercy of what footage you have. Uh, did you run into yeah. any situations where you wanted to further pursue an angle and you just ran out of footage? <laughs> Yeah, well, we we did run out of footage. I think we used pretty much just about every usable scrap of of studio footage, um, and and uh, you know the 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 biggest challenge really was in finding um, enough of Tom's voice to uh, include in this because he didn't do a lot of of filmed or, or recorded interviews at that time. And we did a ton of print interviews. Um, and we had some interviews that were done for print. And so they were recorded as a way of, you know, transcribing it later or whatever, but the sound quality was was very bad because it wasn't recorded. It was like probably just a little tape recorder on a table far away, you know, not a microphone right up in his face like you would do for probably say, a radio backstage it's backstage at some dingy place too. <laughs> sure. And and so, you know, the there's there's a certain element in documentaries where if the material is so compelling, it doesn't really matter what the quality is in terms of like, it could be, you know, you think of like cell phone footage of, you know, the Rodney King beating, for example, like you, you don't, you don't care that it's terrible quality video because what's happening on that video is so important. Um, and not to, you know, that, that not to, compare that to, to what we were doing, but there are certain pieces of Tom's audio in, in the film that are not great quality, but we tried to clean them up as best we could. And we used them because it was the only option that we had to be able to tell that story. But I think that there, there certainly were things that um, could have been made more clear if if uh, if I had had an opportunity to ask Tom a, another question. <laughs> oh, see, no, that's you're you know? going exactly where I wanted to go, which is like, what's a question that you just wish you had the chance to ask him? Oh, well, you know, I I would like to hear that that ultimately this making this music did make him happy because I think you can see that he's happy in the footage. And I think that you can tell by the way he talks about the songs that, you know, he was proud of that music. And, um, you know, I think that, that, he went through a little bit of a dark period in his life after the wildflowers era. He, he, when he eventually did uh, get divorced and, and, and he struggled with drugs and the, you know, there, there were moments of darkness on the horizon and this period. And one of the reasons that I wanted to just, keep the film as much as possible. We stayed in this little bubble of this moment of happiness um, because 
There, there have been other films about Tom Petty. Obviously, there was a, a Peter Bogdanovich film that came out uh, a while ago, and and that explored his whole career up to that point, and and delved into kind of the darkness that that came after Wildflowers. So, for anyone that's curious about it, there there is a film they can go watch and find out about it. But this was like this beautiful little time capsule that had been saved away like in a little jar that said open in in 2021 you know and it feels to me like the perfect moment to to open this this beautiful jar because we were coming out of this kind of dark period in american history and 2020 was a terrible year for a lot a lot of people all over the world but um, but to to stay in this this moment of creativity and and joy and and, and celebrate the power of music um, just felt like the only thing that I wanted to do in that moment and the only thing that I wanted to see or hear in that moment and. Um, and and you know as I said there, there was no reason to 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 go beyond it because there is another film for the completists out there that, that want to, to see um, everything that happened uh, before and after. It, it's there for you to find if you want it. Absolutely. Um, so one other major contributor to your film and your narrative uh, is Rick Rubin, who I mm. assume has more stories than any of us will ever know. <laughs> uh, I'm sure he must. <laughs> how difficult is it to almost trim Rick Rubin down, you know, and and figure out which of the stories that he's telling? Because I felt like every time he was talking, I was so riveted and I wanted him to just keep going. And you think about all the people that he's worked with over the years. What was it like getting his con contributions? Oh, well, his voice is so amazing. Like, I don't, I, you know, I, so the, the very first thing that I did when I was brought into this project was that Adria Petty, Tom's daughter, had set up the Rick Rubin interview and the conversation with Mike and Ben. And, um, I wasn't there. I was listening in on a Zoom and and I could see the camera feed of, of what was being shot. Um, and I could text Adria with like follow up questions and that sort of thing. But um, I remember just I the, the camera feed wasn't wasn't very good quality to watch and I, I w wasn't really paying that much attention to it but I would get lost in listening to his voice and I remember just thinking wow I could listen to that guy talk all day <laughs> he just has this almost perfect like radio type of voice or something um, but yeah I mean he he was fantastic in in helping to frame the story because the thing that was great about his experience with this record is it was the first time he had worked with with Tom Petty and so like whereas all of the other guys have this amazing incredible history with Tom and and they know all the backstory or whatever like Rick was coming in with no baggage with no you know preconceived notions other than just knowing that Tom was an excellent songwriter that he wanted to work with and was excited to to be working with him and Tom and Tom sort of fed off of Rick's enthusiasm. You know, he talked about that, about Rick being a, a young guy who was just really enthusiastic. And I think that they they both kind of were trying to impress each other all the time, which is why, which is maybe part of why that record is so freaking good, <laughs> is that they were both bringing it, you know, bringing their A game and, and trying to impress each other. And um, and the the sort of connection um, that they had in their collaboration and the way that they pushed each other is really palpable in the footage, and and it's a really cool thing to see. So for for me, 
it was great to be able to just let those scenes play out as much as possible. Did Full Moon Fever have as an effect on you? Uh, as, I mean, it was an enormous album, you know, but to hear Rick talk about watching, you know, listening to it 10,000 times, that's not an yeah. exaggeration. That album was everywhere when it came out. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I I, I listened to it. I mean, I the, the that's a record that, you know, probably every song that, that plays on that record, I could sing along every lyric of every song yeah, <laughs> because yeah, yeah. I've heard it so many times, you know? Um, and, you know, I, I remember when Wildflowers came out, uh, sort of noticing the departure for, for Tom. And, and when you think about Rick Rubin was at a point in his career where he had, you know, his hip hop background and he had done one record with Mick Jagger was the first kind of like legacy artist that he had produced, but he hadn't done the Johnny Cash, uh, you know, record. He hadn't become the sort of guru of Americana music that, that he, you know, eventually did become. And so it's interesting to see this coming together of, of different generations and, and different backgrounds, but winding up in the same place in the same time and, and working together to, to create a kind of new sound for, for an artist like Tom Petty. Lightning in a bottle. Um, I will get you out of yeah. here on this one, Mary. How important it is is it for you to have your film world premiere at South by, which is you know, it, the two pillars of it are film and music. I know it's it's such a joy. I've always wanted to bring a film to South by, and my only heartbreak is that I can't be in Austin right now going out to hear live music and <laughs> and 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 meeting other filmmakers in person and I'll have to be satisfied with uh, meeting people by zoom <laughs> but uh, it's it's a it's an honor and a privilege to be part of South by Southwest well I thoroughly enjoyed it uh, I thought it was a fantastic documentary petty fans are going to love it and uh, I thought you did a really great job of capturing the uniqueness of that time period so Thank you so much for your time. I Thank really you. appreciate it. And uh, continued success with the film. Absolutely. Thank you so much. The one thing that I would love to be able to tell you about this Tom Petty documentary is when you will be able to see it, but it is just now making its way through South by Southwest and doesn't yet have distribution as far as we can tell. It feels like it's going to land probably on a streaming service. I would imagine Amazon Prime sort of stepping up and giving it its one of a musical documentary slots or even Hulu, which likes to focus on musical documentaries. I'd like to see somebody snatch it up because it's a really well-made doc. Uh, once we have any details about it, I'll make sure to share it with you guys through the Real Blend social uh, media channels and make sure that we get that information out to you guys. In the meantime, um, just to give you guys a little bit of a tease about what's to come, you know we use hashtag if it happens because these things haven't officially been booked, but we have a couple of really exciting directors who are lining up as guests on the Roblin podcast. Hopefully we will be able to bring those to you very, very soon. We always have the premium content that's dropping every Monday on the Roblin premium show as well too. And we'll be back with uh, brand new episodes of all the things you love about Real Blend coming to your audio podcast platforms very very soon and finally if you are watching this bonus episode on our youtube channel make sure you go down and hit subscribe turn on your notifications and every time we drop a new real blend episode you'll be the first ones to come and watch it